Landscape photography is pretty seldom about the gear that you own. What's more important is putting in the hours out in the field with whatever equipment you have at hand, trying to maximize your chances of being in the right places at the right times. And probably more important than anything, working on composition. There are a handful of investments, however, that in my opinion can massively improve your landscape photography as soon as you start using them. I'm Henry, by the way. This is me beginning today's adventure, already wet and confused by some Lakeland alpacas. Join me as I talk you through five purchases that made a huge difference to my photography as a whole. So we are very quickly returned to classic British winter conditions. It's mild, sitting around 10 degrees Celsius, something like that. And it's wet, it's drizzly, <laughs> it's misly, but I still love it, it's nice to be out. Um, but yeah, those cold conditions didn't last very long, did they? Um, so yeah, in today's video, five tips on um, things that you, you can purchase, really. I'm not, I'm not one to really talk about gear, but these are things that definitely, I'm talking overnight, improved my landscape photography. Simple as that. Maybe a couple of extra ones as a little bit of a bonus as well. But first things first, I'm gonna have a little bit of a wander around. I've chosen this specific location deliberately today to try and suit these drizzly weather conditions. You know, that's a little tip in itself. Work to the weather conditions. <laughs> and uh, yeah, let's go see what we could find. And then we'll get into tip or purchase number one. So as the rain tumbles down here in the wonderful Lake District, this is a good opportunity to talk about purchase or tip number one, and that is outdoor gear, man, outdoor clothing. So this one may come as a little bit of a surprise to a lot of you, because of course, it's got nothing to do with camera gear, you know, tripods, cameras, lenses, memory cards, nothing to do with any of that stuff. But outdoor gear changed my photography for the better overnight you know, in the drop of a hat, genuinely. He's so important, and here's the thing, this is why I'm so passionate about this one. When I first started out, I remember it vividly in New Zealand, I'd just grab a few garments and pop out into the cold, think nothing of it. I'd go out in trackies, you know, little woolen jumpers. I remember going out in steel toe-capped work boots, hiking, because it's all that I had. And I was just freezing, man. And this is the crux of it. Everything comes from your brain, it's all about trying to give your creativity the best possible chance when you're out and about. If you're cold, if you're wet, if you haven't got the right hiking boots and your feet are wet, all you're gonna to wanna to be doing, all your brain is gonna be telling you is get me home now, I'm mad for a cup of tea and I need to warm up. So it doesn't matter if you've got a camera that's worth five grand and it's a million megapixels. If you're not wanting to be out taking photographs because you're cold and you're wet, it matters not. <laughs> so yeah, outdoor clothing, this is my PPE, this is my protective equipment. It means the world, and it means that I can stay out in daft conditions like this, where, by the way, you'll take a lot of your best photographs in inclement weather. Um, it means a lot to me, and I certainly wouldn't be without my waterproofs, my warm clothes, my down jackets, hiking boots, things like that. So that's a good one to start with, and a good one to think about. Let's crack on. <laughs> I'll tell you what guys, that little, that little stream jump there was a bit nervy, probably shouldn't have done it in hindsight, but it's getting me to where I need to go a little bit quick. I wanna be down. Remember that sort of roaring, rushing river that I crossed over on the bridge earlier? That's where I wanna be. That's the sort of photography that I think is gonna suit this weather. But as we're en route, um, I wanted to talk about tip or purchase number two. This one, um, I, keep, I keep wanting to say this is like the biggest one, but they're probably all equal in that sense. Before I tell you, let me tell you this, and people that watch me regularly, I hope, will vouch for me on this one. I am not the type of photographer to try and encourage or persuade people to go out and buy gear. I don't care, you know, I'd rather spend my own money and getting myself out into the landscape, that sort of thing. Um, but 
I'd like to think that that gives me a little bit more credibility because these things are genuinely um, things that transformed the way I take photographs and just improved things so much, you know. And yeah, this, this is another big one and that is investing in longer focal lengths. And look, of course, this can be expensive. It can be really expensive and I don't like the thought of that. Like I just said, that I'm trying to encourage people to go out and spend a load of money. But here's the thing, right? When I got my first camera, my Nikon D3100 back in Canada, I got with it an 18 to 55 millimeter lens, a really good middle of the range lens. And I used that for a bit, but then I was absolutely mad to get a wide angle lens. And I remember getting it when I got into, I think New Zealand, and it was a Takina 11 to 16 millimeter. And I bought that with my Nikon D7200. If I could go back, I'd have told myself, don't buy the wide angle lens, Henry, get a longer lens. And that is because for me, it opens up so many doors, so many different possibilities of how you can photograph the landscape. Today, in fairness, is the worst possible example because visibility is so poor. But you can still see, look at the trees up here on the ridge line. Look at the buildings off there. You know, we've got some fells off in the background. We've got little dry storm walls. Think about the patterns in the landscape. With a wide angle lens, in my opinion, for the most part, you're fairly limited. I mean, what can I photograph here? Like, I can photograph that. And that's about it, one photograph. All right, I could change my foreground a little bit, but I certainly don't feel like I could get that creative, you know, in comparison to those longer focal lengths. Now, I think my first long lens was a 55 millimeter to 300 millimeter. And that is when things started changing with my photography. I love long lens landscape photography. And some of my favorite photographs are taken using longer focal lengths. It's as simple as that. So yeah. That is another massive one for me. Invest in longer focal lengths if you can. Of course, at this stage, it's really worth saying this is so subjective. You may have already made up your mind. You might not be interested in longer focal lengths. You might be mad for a wide angle lens like I was, you know, but these are things from my experience. Do not take what I am saying as gospel. It's all just my opinion. Don't take, um, what anyone says as gospel for that matter <laughs> in terms of photography. You've got to make your own mind up, but I'm trying to give you a little bit of advice from things that I've experienced, right? Let's see if we can get down to this darned river, man. <laughs> on to investment number three that I believe can transform, that can improve your landscape photography instantly, overnight. <laughs> and this one is filters. Now, when I talk about filters, I only use two types of filters for my landscape photography exclusively, and that is neutral density filters and a polarizing filters. Uh, neutral density filters are fantastic if you want to start doing a little bit of long exposure photography. Um, I would be using one in this sort of situation, but to be honest, it's already quite dark today, so it's just not necessary. However, the polarizing filter in this instance is working absolute wonders. This is actually the perfect example of why a polarizing filter, in my opinion, is so important. So as you've seen up there on your left-hand side, this is just a live recording of my Nikon Z7, and this is the photograph. This is the composition that I'm going for, which I'll get into in a second, but first things first, Let's have a look at the effect of the polarizing filter. As you've seen it there, look at the water. That's without the polarizing filter at all. No effect whatsoever. Now, as I spin it around, look how it gets rid of the glare of that water. There is no more sheen on the top of that water. We'll do that once again. That, no polarizing filter compared with that. Oh, it cuts through all of that glare. It changes the dynamic of this photograph altogether. There's no way I'd be able to do that without this filter. Absolutely fantastic, so I wouldn't be without them. Now, let me just talk about this composition quite quickly because I don't know, this is a really weird concept, you know, you're gonna have to bear with me here, but I've got this idea of fjords. Think about the Western fjords 
of, of Norway, you know, or the, or the fjords of the southern island of New Zealand. I'm imagining that I'm stood on the top of a mountain peak, 1,500 metres shooting down into a sort of estuary that leads out into the sea, which would be actually just this small channel here. Whereas actually, obviously, we're just shooting some limestone boulders here. We're zoomed in at around about 50 millimetres, and it's given us this really nice abstract feel to this photograph, you know. Um, so I'm shooting this at around about one sixth of a second, which is working perfectly to capture the movement of the water up here and these streams of water as they move downwards to the bottom of the photograph. And the only other thing to say really is that I'm actually focus stacking this photograph because it is very intimate and I want it to be really sharp right from here all the way right to the top of the image where we've got that fast flowing water up there. Um, so it's taken actually about 10 photographs and I'll stack all of them together in post-production um, to make sure that everything's nice and sharp. I've definitely had to bump my ISO up a little bit, I think to ISO 800, something like that, to allow me to get one sixth of a second. But a nice intimate photograph and uh, a wonderful use of the polarising filter. So that is us back to the van, ladies and gents. I'll tell you what, that was a wonderful little morning of landscape photography. A little bit wet and windy, but I really do feel like the, the type of landscape there that we just explored really is well suited to these sorts of conditions. And I haven't seen the photograph yet, but I think I'm gonna be pretty happy with it, you know. So moving on to the penultimate purchase, investment number four that I believe will really benefit your landscape photography. And that one is, uh, tried to hide it for effect I don't really know why but that is the tripod like everything in this list really and again going back to what I was saying before don't take this for gospel and this is definitely not a 100% necessity for you to go out and be taking photographs but for me I love my tripod and let me tell you this I use this thing a lot and you know aside from the obvious practical purpose of the tripod to shoot long exposures. I absolutely love long exposure photography, man. I also like the fact that it generally really slows me down, you know, allows me or forces me to think a lot more about my compositions and, you know, think a lot more in depth. It happened just there, down at the river, when I was photographing them little fjords, the limestone boulders. I was faffing around with this bad boy so much, it was just naturally making me think about composition a lot more absolutely fantastic so yeah big fan of the old tripod now tip number five or investment number five requires me to be at a completely different location so we best crack up I'll tell you what, I have to admit, that was a horrendous pasty from Greg's. It was, it was cold. It was cold. I feel like they should tell you that it's cold. All right, mate, uh, pasty's cold, by the way. Is that all right? Do you still want to buy it? You just assume that it's going to be hot. Anyway, nice cup of tea to drown my pasty sorrows. But we are back in the office, if you can't tell. And this was the location where I wanted to talk about investment number five this is the final one besides the two bonus ones which we'll get into but this one if you haven't guessed is post processing i think i've said this about all of the investments but this has to be the most important one it's definitely up there um, so i've always used lightroom and photoshop so i can't really talk about any other programs i know there's free programs out there you know you don't have to go out and spend money you can edit photographs on your phone for free some of that software is actually all right. You know, I do it sometimes for some quick edits on my iPhone. But regardless of how you're doing it, I believe 
personally, it is imperative. You know, it's a very high percentage of landscape photography in general for me, probably like half, 50%. You know, I've got that raw file on my memory card, which is just that raw, unedited, flat. You know, it's just a load of information that needs work doing to it on the computer to bring out the best of that photograph. So I've actually just got the image up from today. It's actually a load of images because if you remember, I said it was a focus stack. So yeah, I guess that first image there is focused down here somewhere. And then as I move through, just the focal point changes, but obviously I'll just stack all of them images together so it's nice and sharp throughout. Obviously you've already seen that photograph. So you know if it was decent or not. Looks all right in Lightroom at the minute, but yeah, post-processing in general, massively important as far as I am concerned, 100% man. Now I did say, didn't I, there was two bonus ones. Can't remember what they are, but I have got them on my phone, hang on. Ah, yeah, these are good. First one is maybe a bit contentious, but that is bag, camera bag. Um, the last thing that you want when you're reacting to nice light, nice conditions, is a really poor carrying system. You know, you want accessibility to your stills camera to be good you want to be you know able to get that camera out as quick as possible i've also recently invested in you know one of those peak design clips i actually only keep my video camera in there but it's really good even just to have access to my video camera my nikon z30 if things you know are happening really quickly i can just grab it from the peak design clip and take a quick shot now finally this is definitely the last one i suppose what we at now tip number seven this one is massive this is, this is the biggest one. This is the biggest one, 100%. And that is travel slash experiences. Goodness me, man, how do I put this? If I'm in the middle of Sheffield one day, take some photographs. The next day, I'm in the middle of Zion National Park. In my opinion, day number two, the photographs are going to be better. That was a horrendous example, but you know what I mean. It's not always guaranteed, and there's nothing to say you cannot get good photographs locally. But, generally speaking, if you're putting yourself in photogenic locations and you're in the right places at the right times, you're gonna get better photographs. It's that simple. Putting yourself in photogenic locations, believe it or not, <laughs> um, is likely to improve your photography. So, yeah. Um, so that's that. I'm gonna edit this photograph that weirdly, again, you have already seen. But thank you so much for tuning in. I would love you to hit the subscribe button if you'd like to see more from me, some landscape photography adventures. And if you could, hit the thumbs up button as well. Ah, that would be greatly appreciated. Thank you so much. And uh, I shall see you on the next adventure. Out.